I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening, everybody. If you holler, I'll use the microphone. If not, I'll not use the microphone. And uh, as you said, being a retired teacher, uh, I've never been accused of not being able to be, be heard. Uh, like I tell people, if you can't hear me, there's two reasons. You're either deaf or you're dead. And nobody's ever, ever said that they cannot, cannot hear me. So, but if anybody hollers, I will, I will use the microphone. I'm going to speak a little bit tonight or try to talk to you a little bit tonight about the uh, serviceman's canteen in Denison, Ohio during World War II. Uh, ask any, any uh, World War II veterans in here, did any of you pass through Denison, Ohio uh, in World War II? Okay, by the way, Denison is spelled with two N's. Any women? that would be in the World War II era. Did any of you women serve in the, uh, in, in the canteen? Okay. Um, Dennis, Ohio is about 200 miles south of here. Not 200 miles, it's about two hours. About 100 miles south of here. Uh, take 77 south and then, uh, then 250 east, and it'll take you to the village of, of Dennis, Ohio. Also, Denison, Ohio is about halfway between St. Louis, Missouri and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And it's also halfway between Columbus, Ohio and Pittsburgh. It's called, was then on the Panhandle line. And a little, little side light there. Uh, there was a park. In fact, the park is still there. But it was called PHAC Park, Panhandle Athletic Club Park. And... Uh, had a had a baseball field, track. Uh, they had races, big picnics. This was all for the railroaders and, and their and their families. But that's 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 beside the point. Um, Denison had been a canteen during World War One, and it was run by the Red Cross. Uh, not as extensive as as what was in World War Two, but it still had a uh, a canteen at the depot. And it, in World War One, in fact, I, I forgot to tell Gary. I, I spoke to one of them, Bud Boring's mother-in-law, was worked there at the at the World War One. I. I spoke with her about ah, about 1979. She's since since passed away, but she told some experiences. Also, Denison was a an area where steam engines need water. And. The area of Eurex 1 Denison has a lot of water. So the trains would come to Denison, going east or west, either direction, and stop and take on water. Huge amounts of water to run the, uh, the, uh, the uh, steam engines. And so it, it was kind of logical that that's where they, they would go uh, to establish the, uh, this, this canteen. The canteen was called over the years by the surf man, Dreamsville. Um, whether this is true or not, I don't know. I can't find anything to disprove it. I can't find anything to prove it. The Glenn Miller recorded a tune called Dreamsville, and it was Denison, Ohio, because that's what the service man called it. The service man called it Dreamsville. When they were when they were coming through to the to the canteen, as I said, um, did Glenn Miller record that tune in honor of Denison? You can't prove it. You can't prove it either way. So the people down there and myself kind of like to think, yeah, Glenn Miller thought so much that he recorded that that song of uh, of uh, Dreamsville. Good story. How did the canteen, canteen get, get started? On December 31st, New Year's Eve, 1941, a, a young lady by the name of Lucille Neusdorfer. Now, Lucille Neusdorfer is no longer living. 
great woman. Uh, she was standing on the platform where the trains would go by, and she would see these, these servicemen, soldiers and sailors, on the train, very sad looking, uh, low, unhappy, traveling east or west. And she thought, something has to be done. We've got to do something. You know, what are we going to do? Now, we've all seen Mickey Rooney movies with Judy Garland. And when they needed money, what did they do? Went to Disney. Pardon? Went to Disney. They put on a play. Guess what they did in Denison, Ohio? Put on a play, honest to God. They put on a play to earn money to start the canteen. Now, Yorkville and Denison had two businesses that really benefited the canteen. One, in Yorkville, by the way, Yorkville and Denison are twin cities like this. Yorkville is a city today, 56, 5,700. Uh, Denison's a village of 3,000, eh, something like that. Yorkville had a good bakery at that time. Denison had um, Clark's Provision, which was a slaughterhouse. Those two businesses were able to provide a lot of products that they needed to serve at the canteen. So what happened was the uh, uh, Baker's Union, in the, out, out of the bakery, decided, let's put on a play. So on, uh, on uh, February 25th, 1942, they put on a program in Denison High School. And over 500 people attended, and they raised several thousand dollars to get the canteen started. And the canteen started on March the 19th, 1942, ran through April the 8th, 1946. That was almost a year after VE Day. And what, seven, eight, nine months after VJ Day? that the trains, that the canteen operated. At this point, I'd like to point out something, and, I, and the reason I ask. The canteen at Denison is not the depot, even though the depot is on a national monument or national memorial. In fact, Wendy Zuckel spoke to this group, I don't know, a year or two ago, and uh, talked about, about the depot and, and what have you. The depot, or excuse me, the canteen is not the depot. It's not even Yorksville or Denison. But what the canteen was, and you gotta honor them, are the women. The women who worked and served at the canteen. Only women, no men, only women served and worked at the canteen. Now, I'll get into the numbers a little, little bit later. The women are the ones that need to be honored. And as uh, Elizabeth said, the monument, we've got these monuments. I'm serious. They'll probably never be done. But we need a monument in Denison to the women who worked at the canteen. These women, they're just, they were unbelievable. And uh, when you ask them, they said, well, that was our way of participating in the war effort. Because they all had husbands, dads, brothers, nephews, maybe grandfathers, all serving in the military. And this was their way of serving in the, in the you know, during, during the war. So they, uh, they put on a play, made some money, and the depot opened, as I said, March 19th, 
Now, when they started the canteen, it was the women of Yorkville and Denison. That's all. With Lucille Neusdorfer, pretty much the head of it. And it was Yorkville and Denison women, and they operated pretty much just in the daylight hours. Maybe say like eight in the morning till five in the evening, something like that. But it was just Yorkville and Denison. Well, immediately, it became too big of a project for Lucille and another woman that I know was rig help to her was, was Edna Cottrell. And I can tell you a story about Edna here a little bit later. Um, just too big. So they, um, they had to do something. When they started this, this, this canteen, Actually, it wasn't at the depot, it was across the street. In a, gra a gra gas station, basically. The women would do everything. Make the sandwiches, wrap the sandwiches, make the coffee, get the apples, get the oranges, the bananas, the cookies, the cakes, the pies, whatever. They baked all of this stuff. And then when the train would come in, they'd run across the street, and if you... They've got plenty of railroaders in here. Well, the railroad, the Pennsylvania Railroad, by the way, was very strict, very schedule conscious, and we're going to run the trains. So the women would get on the trains, Try to serve the men the, do the coffee, the sandwiches, the donuts, whatever. Well, hey, they take on water, 10 minutes, <laughs> train's gone. Women, you're on the train. You get back to Denison the best way you can. Now, we're talking, we ain't talking five or 10 miles. You're going east, you're going to Steubenville. And Steubenville is probably 50 miles east of Denison. You're going west, you might go to go, get to Newcomerstown. I don't know if they'd stop there. But then you're at Coshocton, which is probably 35, 40 miles west of Denison. Now, sometimes they'd be able to help get on a train and come back. Okay. But, hey, best they could do. Or they would hand it through the window. But the railroad ain't going to stop. The railroad's got a schedule to go. And they're not going to slow down. Okay? So it got too big of a task. Got, got too big. So Lucille and a few others, they finally went to the Salvation Army. And the Salvation Army said, yeah, we'll take it over. So... The, uh, the commander at that time was, I uh, um, can't remember his name, it's every part of him. But right as they said yes, he gets transferred. So it, 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 it fell on the shoulders of the woman by Elizabeth Brooks, Salvation Army, in the Dover Citadel, Dover, Ohio, Citadel. And she was nicknamed the Angel of Mercy, because she took on this task of the salvation of the canteen. The canteen then, with these women, had eight counties. I think I can come up with seven of them. I'm not sure of the eighth one. Tuscarawas County, Stark County, Harrison County, Carroll County, Guernsey County, Coshocton County, Holmes County, and I think the eighth one is Jefferson County, which is Steubenville. Eight counties that we drew women from to work at the canteen. Now, they, they just, they, you know, they, had, they did everything. The, these women did everything. They baked the cakes. They baked the cookies. They baked the pies. They made the sandwiches. They made the coffee. They wrapped the sandwiches. They wrapped maybe the pies and the cookies and the cakes and so forth. They got the apples, the bananas, and so forth. The women did everything. 
Now, the canteen then, when the, when the uh, Salvation Army took over, then, and think about this, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Didn't take any days off. These women were there Christmas, New Year's, Easter, their birthdays, their anniversaries, whenever. Remember last winter? Kind of cold last winter, wasn't it? These women didn't stop because it was cold, hot, rainy, or anything in between. They were serving the men that came through, east and west, on the Pennsylvania Railroad. Now, we think, well, that's not too bad. Well, yeah. You know how many trains it would go through a day? These are troop trains. About 20. Just, just troop trains. Six, seven, eight hundred military on one train. Now, as I told you, the railroad, they ain't stopping. That's what Elizabeth Brooks did. Working with the Army and the railroad, they were, they were able to slow the railroad down. They could feed all these men. The men also were able to get off the train. The Army said, yeah. The Navy said, yeah, the men can get off, off the train. So the women then started to serve from the carts that were there. And these, these men, uh, one thing I'd like to add, I know that there's one picture, because I just looked at it a few days ago, but I've seen another one. They didn't discriminate, because there's a picture of an African-American sailor being served at the canteen. He was in military. So he was going to be given food, you know, coffee, donuts, um, sandwiches, whatever. Now, each, each community had its own supervisors, I'll call them, organization, women. Let's say uh, Medina. I you know Medina is not one of them. But let's say Medina would have the first Monday of the, of the month. The, the city, is Medina a city? The city of Medina would have to provide women for the canteen. And there would be uh, organizers, supervisors, we all call them, women from Medina that would get, their, get the workers to get down. And then when they got down there, there were supervisors. This wasn't a, 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 a slip shot. This was, this, was, this was well run. Obviously, you know, you're, you're serving 20 trains a day or more. Seven, 800 men on a train. And they ain't stopping long, folks. You got to have it organized. Then each, each community would provide everything. And... Uh, something I, I haven't, you know, haven't mentioned here yet, um, rationing. Here's women are, built, are baking cakes, cookies, pies, but you got sugar that's rationed, you got flour that is rationed, maybe other items. So they've got, they've, they're, they're, they're providing their own to, to provide for the men. Now you go to Steubenville, for example. Steubenville, I said, is about 50 miles east of Denison, and the roads were two lanes, and they're like this. Gasoline rationing. So they've got to take part of their gasoline rationing to provide transportation to get to Denison to serve in the canteen. at 10 degrees below zero at 3 o'clock in the morning. Think about that. You know, last year we were comfortably nice warm in bed, warm house, right? Not these women. 
seven years ago. No, no. They got dad, brother, uncle, whatever. And they got to make sure that they get coffee, sandwiches, whatever. Um, also, besides troop trains, they had regular passenger trains that would go through with servicemen on them. Serve those servicemen. You know, now, if you're a civilian on that passenger train, you can't get served. I don't care if you're, you know, Bill Gates, got the most money in the world. You don't get served. Sorry, Jack, you ain't in the military. No, no, only military was served by these women. Also, anybody who couldn't get off the train, for whatever reason, they would serve them through the window. Like hospital trains would go through. Servicemen on there, they're going to be served at 3 o'clock in the morning. These women package them up in bags, give them through the window. Any serviceman going east or west on the Pennsylvania Railroad were going to be served by these, by these women. And they, nobody. Now, I've, now I have heard the contradiction on this one. On a couple women that I interviewed, they said they did not serve German POWs. Other information I've looked at, German POWs were served. I don't know. Uh, knowing these women, I'm betting that they served the, the German POWs because those POWs were somebody's son, could have been somebody's brother, you know, grandson, etc. And even though they were our enemy, they still were, were a, a, a human being that they, that they were, were serving. So these women, they didn't, they didn't just sit around. They were making the sandwiches. They were wrapping the sandwiches, making the coffee, everything. Um, now, 4,000 women volunteered from those eight counties. 4,000 women served at the, at, the, at the canteen. Now, I interviewed a few of them about 25 or 35 years ago, eh, 12, 14, something like that. And I said, ask them, God forbid, but would you do it again? And each one of them said, you better believe it, I'd do it again. I said, even though the cold weather, I'd do it again. Tells you something about those women that, uh, that were there. Um, and as I said, all, all, the, all the food was, was made by these women. They were been made at the, at the depot then. Some I left out. After the Salvation Army got involved and they got cooperation with the railroad and they got cooperation from the Pennsylvania Railroad, then they moved to the depot and to what once was a restaurant that had whatever moved out. And they were able to use that, that facility in the uh, in the in in the depot and these women you know they didn't they did not not stand around i mentioned a little thing here um the army said uh the salvation army and the army said if you were tw you had to be 21 or older to serve one of the women well a woman but lives in york by the name of mary lee mcclave said that she was a teenager. So what she would do, she'd get down with her mom, but she had to stay in the depot and look out the window. Couldn't work. Now I know another woman told me she was a teenager, went down with her mom, she worked. Hmm. Just, you know, how close they checked. Because later on, as the, as the depot became so popular, at night hours, MPs would be put there during the night for, for security. Um, it was not that they were going to harm anybody, but just for, for the added, 
added uh, security. As I said, the, the depot began in, in, in uh, March of, um, of um, 42. I mentioned Edna Cottrell. Edna's this little, she's passed away, just a little thing. No bigger than a, than a Clark bar. And uh, she's got a brother, George. George was the opposite. George, big guy. George ended up becoming chief of police at Denison. George was in the service down in Mississippi. And some guy was on there, they were talking about, hey, George, you're from Denison, Ohio, aren't you? Yeah, why? He said, well, I went back there through the plant. Uh, I got some coffee and donuts and a sandwich there. Free. Cover his ears. George looked, yeah, guy know George says, what the hell are you talking about? There's nothing like that. I know where that, I, I was reared around those tracks. I played on those tracks. That's my hometown. What are you talking about? Hey, I'm telling you, I got free coffee and sandwich and donuts. And I met this cutest little girl. I talked, she said, wait a minute. You're talking about my sister Edna, I think. <laughs> yeah, that's her name, Edna. George said, oh, wait a minute. Well, you know, in those days, you couldn't pick up a phone and call. So got a hold of Edna. She said, yeah, George. We got going on there, so forth. So uh, give me some numbers. I noticed my time here. You talk a lot, Gary. 4,000 women. Over 600,000 hours of volunteer. Cash donations to the, deep, to the um, canteen. $115,000. I don't know what that would be in today's money. Um, now, how many servicemen went through? One, over 1.3 million servicemen went through east and west. Denison, Ohio canteen was the third largest used canteen in World War II. Little village of Denison with those eight counties. Number one was the uh, stage door canteen in New York City. Hmm. Number two was a canteen in Chicago. And number three was Denison, Ohio. And it was known all over the world, folks. It was known in the foxholes in Europe. And I talked to a guy that was in the service. He was in Australia. And the, the servicemen had learned. Hey, where are you from? Well, they might have been from New Philadelphia. They might have been from someplace else. But they learned to say, I'm from Denison. They knew where Denison was. This guy said, I'm from Denison, Ohio. He wasn't, but he was. The guy said, do they really have a canteen there? Oh, yeah. He said, I've heard all about that. Another guy popped up. Before you knew it, there were four or five men had heard of Denison, were stationed in Australia. This was known all over because of the smiles, the friendliness, the good nature of the women that, uh, that, that served there. Um, little, a couple little stories. A couple little ornery ones here, but that's okay. The, de the depot itself, even today, is very narrow. Probably from this wall to about the second to last row. That's all, the, that's all the deeper is long. Now, right on the other side, you can come in this door, go out that door, cross Center Street, and there's a nightclub called the Top Hat. You been there, Dave? No, no. <laughs> the Top Hat. Nice place. I also got known because they could go right from there, psh, go to the Top Hat, Get a beer, get a shot of whiskey, anything else, and hopefully make it back. Now, Mom told me this story. Dead of winter, there was a sailor. Train's going east. He barely makes it on the outside of the car. The last car, he's hanging on. And she said she wondered if his buddies got him inside 
or did he have to go all the way to Steubenville, like 50 miles east? You know, the last thing she said she remembers is, is uh, what was Jewish Street Crossing, which is the farthest eastern part of the, of the village. And he's hanging on for dear life on the outside. She, said, she wondered, you know, did he get pulled in or, or, or what? Um, by the end of June of 1943, they had given up 12 tons of magazines to the servicemen. Um, as I said, this was known. Time Magazine had an article in it about, about this. Um, one thing with men, the women would do, they'd put their names and addresses in some of the little goodies, starting pen pals, you know, right to some of the servicemen. One of them, interesting, good name of, uh, the name was Betty, uh, C-H-A-L-F-A-N-T. She married her pen pal, who was from Brooklyn, New York. And um, I don't know if any others had happened, but uh, she, she married. A couple of little, little stories here, and then I'll shut up. Uh, this woman tells you about uh, Dennison. She's returning home to her Arkansas from Pennsylvania. And she read a little article in a story about briefly telling about Dennison, Ohio how he had fed, the women had fed them a uh, hospital train. She said, well, it's nothing. The train's going, and the conductor said, Denison, Ohio, all the servicemen on this particular car, and so on, they were on a bustle now. I mean, they're gonna look good. You know, they're putting their blouses on, they're straightening their blouses, putting the tie on, making the shoes are shine, combing their hair, putting the hat on right, man. She said there were, there were two young servicemen behind her. Pretty much said, what the hell's going on? So the serviceman in the car said, you don't know about Denison? You never heard of Denison, Ohio? They had. They knew what was waiting for them. She said, it was night. There was a station, all lighted. The women, smiles, friendly, and food. And every serviceman was, was served. And when they got back on, these two men, the rookies, you might say, now they know about Denison. And she became very um, ebullient, you might say, very um, out outspoken about how good Denison was. Now, this story I have a little trouble getting through. One of the women I, I, I interviewed several years ago said she was serving at the canteen. There was about an 18-year-old boy got off. He was looking at the cookies, the cakes, the pies, the apples, the bananas, the coffee, the chewing gum. And she went up to him and said, can I help you, son? He said, yeah, well, I'm looking what I can buy for a dime. He said, Uncle Sam fed me in St. Louis and I won't get any food again until I get to Philadelphia. Now, if you're very going on a train in the middle 40s, going from St. Louis to Philadelphia, that's probably close to a three-day drive, a trip. And she said, no, all this is free. He said, I don't have to pay. She said, nope. So she said, I loaded him up with about three bags of sandwiches and cookies and pies and cakes and whatever and so forth and a couple cups of coffee she said he took about two or three steps and turned around and said now i know what we're fighting for he said she at that time then he got up on the got in the car on the train and you know he's got the cup of coffee and got to eat a sandwich and she said, just a look on his face. She said, she always thinks about that. And she said, very sudden, this was back in like 1979. She said, I never, very few days that have passed that I don't think about that young boy. Whatever happened to him? 
Did you make it through the war? What did you do after the war? And so forth. But that's the women that served the canteen at Denison. Again, I said it's not the depot, it's the 4,000 women. Day and night, cold weather, hot, whatever, that served from these eight counties. I, you know, maybe have any questions? I'll shut up here so Gary can, can talk. I'm going to talk about the, the tours that we have taken over in Europe. My buddy and I, Dick Seifert, started out doing Civil War tours in the 1990s. And we did all of the major battles of the Civil War. And we went from that into doing some Indian Wars and then some Revolutionary Wars, and that's when Mick got involved doing the Revolutionary Wars. Well, we did some of that. And an outfit that we was touring with, the CWEA and uh, History Forum, started doing tours of World War II battles. So Mick and I signed up for the first one we did was the Battle of the Bulge. And a couple years later, we did D-Day in, in Normandy. And a couple years after that, we did Sicily and Italy. So we met a lot of nice people and a lot of historians, and we had some, uh, a couple of veterans with us. When we did the Battle of the Bulge, we had a captain of the 99th Infantry Division named Charlie Rowland that went over with us. And we met two young Belgian boys over there, uh, with JP, I, I, I butcher Belgian names, uh, Speeder or Spader, or, and, and the other one was Sean Louis, it was pronounced Sale. And they took us on, on the tours, and we, they took us, we flew into uh, Brussels, and the, the company picked us up and took us down to a little town in Germany was on the border of Germany and Belgium called Monchau. And it was a quaint little, quaint little village that uh, I guess they said Hitler used to vacation there. They'd see him riding his bike up and down the street. So he demanded that there was no shelling on Monchau. So when we went there, it was just like it was during the Second World War. It was re a really nice place. And uh, we went. Uh, down to the restaurant one night, and we, we don't know from, you know, when anybody speaks German or they speak English. So we asked the little waitress to come up. We said, do you speak English? She said, yes. And she probably spoke better English than both of us did. And she said she'd just come back from South Carolina visiting somebody there. So, And while we're in the restaurant, Here's this parade, and I want, I want you to tell this story about the parade, Mick. There's a parade coming down the street, people holding candles, and Mick remembers that. But sir, seriously, come on up and tell them what, what happened with that parade. That, uh, well, as I said, we went to this restaurant, and we were going to get some <coughs> German beer and German brats and sauerkraut. We heard this music, we heard this band coming by. There was a band of maybe 20, 25 members with a, a group following 20, 25 members. And we asked these, the young people in the restaurant, what's going on? I mean, they didn't say anything. So, we don't know. A couple, three nights later, we're going back into Monchau. And as we get down, kind of like in the square, we see the same band, stationary. We see the same group of people behind them. And now we see a policeman, a Belgian policeman. We've never seen one before. Okay, they play their, their, their songs, whatever, there's two or three of them. But well, we're standing there, and there's a group of people, and if they get through with their, with their song, I'm not lying to you, <laughs> they go, Sig Heil, Sig Heil, Sig Heil. <laughs> and we said, oops, <laughs> what are we getting into? Swastika armbands. Yeah. yeah, and so 
uh, the band moved on and we, moved on. we snuck back up to the hotel yeah, and didn't ask any on. didn't ask any more questions well, yeah so what the the portion of the battle that we did was what they call the north shoulder is there, are there any vets in here that was over there by chance was, was you there at the bulge I got to watch what I say then because this gentleman knows a lot more about it than I do the, the first place they took us to they took us to into the forest the uh, what is it uh, Hurtkin forest yeah and they took us down this uh, I call it a logging road that it was a road going through the forest one side of the road was Germany the other side was Belgium well one of the uh, I think it was Jean Paul that took us down there and he's standing up on the hillside in Belgium and showing us two hills over in Germany across the big valley one of them was hill 627 and the other one was hill 88 and the 627 hill got uh, nicknamed uh, Purple Heart Hill because of all of the casualties that happened there. On the 13th, he said the Americans uh, attacked that hill, the two hills, and I guess what they wanted to do, they wanted to get over to the rural valley because they was ready to start through Germany and they was afraid the Germans was going to blow the dam and flood the valley and make it tougher for them to get over there. So they started on the, on the 13th, and of course the Battle of the Bulge started on the 16th, and they got run out, they got run back. So they showed us that, that portion, and we went through the, uh, through the, uh, uh, you know, the forest, and, and a lot of the foxholes are still there, still visible. Of course, there are trees growing out of them and, and so on now. But uh, some of the foxholes were, were pretty big. It was probably 15 by 15, and they said they were uh, company command posts. So it, it was, and there was some, uh, uh, what, what do I want to say? Uh, yeah, oh, oh yeah. What, what did they find when we was walking through there? They found part of, was it a German? part of a German uniform that they pulled up out of the ground it was still there and these these boys uh, started as teenagers uh, picking up facts in fact on Hill uh, 620 627 uh, he said the first time he went up there he found hundreds of German uh, gas masks that was just laying on the ground and this was in in 1980s he was found they was still laying on the ground so I, I got another story about the, uh, they call them the diggers. Uh, they, they've done quite a job and there's a lot of stories that they've done a lot of good things for the, the boys. And the second stop we went to was uh, in a road between Lanzarath and what was the other name at the railroad station? Uh, Bar Burkholz, I think. Again, I butcher these names up. But uh, the INR platoon, they sent out from the 99th out on their, uh, out on their flank to, well, INR is what? In information and uh, recon. So they were sitting out there in their, in their foxholes up on this hill, on the wood line up on the hill, watching the road between Berk or Lanzarath and Burkholz. And on the six, morning of the 16th, here come the Germans down the road. And there was some houses down on the road, but he's up there with these binoculars. He's what, two or 300 yards, I would say, from the road. And uh, they let, all of a sudden, he saw the, all the, he said it sounded like the German army coming through there. And he called back for uh, uh, shelling, uh, artillery shelling, and they said, well, you gotta be crazy. There's not that many Germans around here. So they, they didn't help him out. They didn't uh, give him the, the, uh, the shelling that he wanted. And there was a little girl standing out there, and there's two stories on this. One story is that when the Germans was going by her house, she ran out and pointed to the boys up on the hill, and the Germans lined up and went up, and they fought them most of the day. But uh, Colonel, or Lieutenant Bach was the lieutenant's name that was in the... Uh, head of the uh, platoon 
and uh, his story is that when the Germans was marching by, the little girl was out there watching them. And one of the German officers went up and asked her where the Americans were, and she pointed towards Burkholz and said that's where they went. So he said he started to fire on them before they even formed up. So they formed up and come up the hill for, I guess, hours after hour. He, would just, he was mowing them down. And uh, they finally, I guess, they raised a white flag from what he's saying, and they wanted to get their wounded off. So he, they stopped firing. They took their wounded off. And when they got them off, they started again, started firing. And they finally figured out, the Germans did, I guess, that they could flank them, because there was only 20 of them up there. And they come in behind them and captured them. And then they wounded him. And uh, three or four of them was wounded, I guess. And they took them down to Lazar Lanzarath, I'm going to call it. And that's probably wrong. Maybe you can help me. Yeah, <laughs> close. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, put them in a, in a building down there. It was a saloon or something they put them in. And I guess they said Bach was saying that he looked at his watch at midnight, and he said, now I'm a man, because his 21st birthday was on the 17th of December. And they took them, and uh, I think they were prisoners the rest of the war. The next stop we went to was up at Burgles. There was a train station up there, and that's where Charlie Rowland was. That's the other guy that was with us on the tour. And he was stationed there. And it was early in the morning, and they had just brought the, the kitchen up from a, what they called it. And it was going to have their first hot meal in days. So they're up there, and it's just turning daylight, and it's very foggy. And coming up the railroad tracks, they see these soldiers coming. And someone said, why are our guys coming back so early? To, for breakfast, it's too early. And the sergeant looked and he says, our men, our men hell, he said, those are Germans coming. So they fired at them and they had a big fight there. Of course, they had to retreat. And they kept falling back. I think they went to Elsenborn Ridge next and dug in there and, and held the Germans up for a while. Then they, uh, they went from Elsenborn to what uh, Twin Cities, uh, Crying Colt, and the other one started with an R, and I forget, I can't tell you the name of that one. But they fought there for a while, and, and as they was uh, retreating, they was blowing the bridges, and, and the Germans had to keep finding their way around and find another bridge to go over. And uh, as it as it wound up, they. Uh, they wound up at, uh, they went, where did they go? From there to Malmendy, I believe. And that's where they had the, the massacre, where they massacred all the, all the boys. The uh, truck that had a caravan of trucks coming out of Malmendy, and the Germans was coming the other one. They met them at this crossroads. It wasn't right in Malmendy. And uh, they showed us the field where they was at. And what was it, a saloon, this lady? lady had there and uh, she was well she disappeared that day they never saw her again and uh, some of the guys they, they wasn't all killed some of them got away and uh, Piper it was the the German colonel that uh, had the north shoulder his job was supposed to go right up to uh, Antwerp and uh, take over the uh, the station where the supply station. So we'd have to uh, have to retreat basically and, and, and quit. So uh, they, let me see here. My wife messed the cards up, Mick. Yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're right. Yeah. yeah, and then we went from, from Malmendy, we went up to uh, Stavelo, the town of Stavelo, and the Americans didn't blow that bridge for some reason. And they said they let one tank go through, 
and and they told us a story about a guy that had a bazooka and, and these tiger tanks uh, he hit them in the front the, the bullets just bounced off of them and, and at Stavolo, we, we in fact we had lunch in Stavolo and we were sitting in the restaurant and uh, <laughs> the waiter come up and said come up to me and to Mick and I and said uh, my friend wants to meet you I said fine send him over he came over it was a doctor from United States that practiced in Washington DC told us his dad was a an American soldier was stationed in Stavolo and his mother lived there they got married after the war and this boy was born in in, in United States and he practiced like I said in Washington DC we said well why would you leave there and come over here to practice medicine socialized medicine he said in in there and he could actually make more money in Belgium practicing than he could in the United States he said by the time I paid all my help all the girls to do the paperwork and wait on my money from the insurance companies and pay my insurance he said I can make more money over here and I could over there and his dad was still living at that time and lived in Las Vegas he said he was going over in a couple of weeks to to see him so that was an interesting story and then we went from there where'd we go to then Mick we went up to uh, about Leglise, I guess was, yeah yeah that was where Piper had run out of fuel run out of ammunition and he was supposed to make it to the to the Meurs River and then across to uh, to Antwerp uh, he, di he didn't make it. He made it to Leglise, and he ran out of, uh, like I say, he ran out of gas and ammunition, and he had to do abandon his tanks and all of his equipment, and w they walked back to Germany. They started out with like 5,000 men, and they walked back to Germany with 800. It was all the men he had left. He had lost all of them, plus all of his equipment. And they, I say they left it there at Leglise. After the war, the town brought somebody in to cut the tanks up and the half tracks and everything for scrap metal. And they saved one tank. What they say they bought it for a bottle of whiskey, the tank, and it's still in the square. It, it's quite a story. Yeah. So I want to tell you a story about the uh, about the diggers these two uh, Belgian boys that we uh, that we met they started as when they was teenagers look just looking for anything they could find uh, gas masks uh, they said they found uh, grenades artillery shells and they tried when they first started I guess they tried to disarm the grenades and the artillery shells until one of their buddies was disarming a shell down in his basement and blew up on him and killed him. So they, they quit doing that. They no, no more of that. So the, the, the story that there's a, it's a local story here about a boy that, uh, that they found up on uh, Purple Heart Hill. Uh, a boy from, in fact, is from Akron. His mom and dad had a uh, business in Akron for years. It was a dry cleaning business. His name was David Reed, and the business was was Reed uh, fam Reed and Benzel. I don't know if any of you, if it's how long it lasted, or if any of you ever heard of it. But I guess in 1935, they moved to Hudson. And he was over there on when they attacked uh, Purple Heart Hill in, I think on the 15th is when the family got a letter that he had been killed. And the, the, as the book goes, a few days later, they got another one that said, he's lost. We can't find him. So. Then in 1951, that many years after that, uh, they called and said he's, the body is not recoverable and they gave up looking for him. Well, some of his buddies 
got with these, these two boys, the diggers, they call them, and asked them if they could help find him. So they went up on, up on the hill, and they looked for weeks and weeks. And, and they was digging up hand grenades and dog tags from other places, other people. And they finally found a dog tag that had David Reed on it and all the information. So they started to dig around there, and I guess two or three foot from where that was at, uh, they dug the grave up. He was buried maybe a foot or two, it had just the bones. And uh, they would send, they've dug up, I think they said 12 Americans and four Germans that they've dug up so far. And they're still doing it, and I guess they have some more help now. They've got a couple other guys helping them. But they're getting up to where they're probably in their 50s now, so I guess they do it every other week rather than every week. So it's, they've slowed down quite a bit. But uh, I thought that was a, quite a story for a, a, a local boy that they found on that hill and uh, sent him back, and his remains are home, and they buried him here. So quite a story. So I don't, I don't know. That's about it. Uh, we, the next trip we took was uh, the day. And I don't know if, if any of you has watched the, the shows or the commentaries they have on TV on, on D-Day and uh, some of the shows that Hal Bumgardner was a, a young boy, he's 19 years old, and he got in with the uh, 29th Infantry on D-Day. It was, he was part of that. And that's where the Bedford Boys was in there. And if you've heard of the Bedford Boys, uh, it's a small town in Virginia. Uh, there was, what, 19 of them, I think, out of that town. More killed per capita than any town in the, in the country. And uh, <clears throat> they have really nice um, monuments. Uh, what uh, this beautiful thing that we go, we go down to a football game down at, uh, in Virginia, at Salem every year, and Bedford is what a half hour, an hour, yeah, from from there. That we go been over there every year. It's quite a place, and uh, they they've been having some financial trouble, but I think they're coming out of it now. But Hal Bumgardner was a young 19 year old from uh, the Bronx in New York that got in with them, and he was in the first wave. When, when they hit, he was wounded five times. He would, in fact, he was over, over there with us, and he comes down to Sarasota with us, and I'll talk to you about Sarasota here. He was running across the beach, and a shell hit his, he was holding his rifle, I guess they carried him like this, hit his rifle and busted it up, and he got a shrapnel in the head, tore his head up. He got shrapnel in the side of his face, tore his side of his face up. He said his upper teeth was laying down on his, this is kind of gruesome, was laying down on his jaw and he couldn't, couldn't talk. And they shot him with some morphine and he and some other guys are walking up a hill and I'll be darned if he don't step on a landmine, blow his toe off. Yeah. And he said he's laying there and he, he can't talk. He's laying on the side of the road and an ambulance is going by so he shoots his gun up in the air and they stop and they get him take him back down to the beach, and they've got them all the wounded laying in rows on the beach, and he said, there's a German up here on the hill picking us off, coming down shooting the wounded. He said, they get to me, I shot him in the knee, that was his fifth, fifth one, he said, he knew the next one was going to be in the head. He said, just before he shot again, a shell from one of the ships come in and uh, got the, uh, the uh, German, yeah, so he said he made it. And he's with us. The CWEA is a company that uh, did the tours. And they have a uh, program every January down in Sarasota, Florida. I don't know if any of you would be, in, hello, would be interested in that. It's a World War II convention that they have a lot of speakers, about six speakers. And, and some veterans, Hal's there every year, 
and Ed Bars. I don't know if he, if you watched any of the Civil War uh, programs, he narrates most of those. And he was a Marine over in the islands that got shot up pretty bad. And worked for the uh, National Park System. Uh, he wound up as the head of it in Washington, D.C., but he's down there every year. What is it, about three days? Something like that. And it's on, uh, it's at uh, Lido, on Lido Beach in Sarasota. And if any of you's interested, we can get you the uh, information on that. But it's, it's really, really nice. They have uh, Carlos D'Este and, I don't know, four or five other historians that, that speak to us. And, uh, of course, Hal Bumgardner and, and Ed Bars uh, speaks to us on that. And it's really a good program. So I, I don't know if we have any, any questions or... Tells you about decisions uh, leaders have to make. Was anybody in here or does anybody have a relative that was in any of the landings on D-Day that went in? I read an article, I'm like these guys here, I get into it. I read an article that Eisenhower knew that the first one or two landings, 80% casualties. So he sent younger, less experienced soldiers in the first two or three landings so that the more experienced soldiers wouldn't suffer the same casualties. That's why the 29th went in. They were all all young boys with, yeah. with no experience, yeah. Imagine making yeah. a decision to send, you know 80% are going to be yeah. killed or wounded. And then uh, I just was curious if anybody here had a relative or, or a friend or knew of anybody that was in on I mean, any of that. That was, that. how would you like to be one of the first ones, survive it, and then find out years later Oh, yeah, I was supposed to be killed and wounded. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was pretty sad because those boys had no idea what they was doing that went in there. It's not a question, but the, the battle you speak of with a little girl, there's an entire book written on that hill called The Longest Winter. And there was a, actually about a double platoon, 25 guys that were handpicked based on athleticism and marksmanship. Mm -hmm. And the author kept saying, headshot, headshot, headshot. But they ran out of ammunition and were captured by... Yeah, that yeah. Hall. It's a fascinating book. And Is it? Was an actor. And they all... No, okay, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. They all survived. Two were shot in the face. One was terribly disfigured. Yes, the one that uh, was in the same foxhole as, as uh, Lieutenant Bach was shot in the face. And Lieutenant Bach was shot in the leg by the same... The same uh, German, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what's your what's your take on the little girl? That yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I don't either. She was on our side. I do too, and that's what Bach says. Said that she was out. She didn't run out and and talk to him. That she was already out there just watching him go by. Yeah, Bach says she wasn't. Bach says she was pointing up towards the the. Uh, Railroad station, yeah, yeah. Yes, he did. I think Tennessee, uh, I think it was Nashville, yeah. Uh, Choiropractor maybe, but uh, as, as I, I, I'm not sure. I know he was in the medical profession. Yeah, I think so, yeah. He was supposed to go with us uh, when we went over, over to the Battle of the Bulge and his wife uh, got got sick and he, he couldn't make it. Yeah, and I'd really like to have had him. They, they was trying to get in through the woods where the Germans were. And the guys were going and they'd get blown up. They had landmines laid all, all across there. So <laughs> Sam says, just follow me. He had his men get right behind him and he'd take a step. And he said, just step where I step. And they had, had been, got through there and artillery was coming in from from uh, the Americans. American artillery was coming in on him. He said he got on the radio and uh, he was in Sarasota and telling us this story. He said, I told him, stop that firing and stop it right now or I'm going to come back there and kick the 
out of somebody. And he said, and I meant it, too. He said, <laughs> yes, yeah, you please. <laughs> I didn't tell Jerry this story a few months ago. We were on Elsinbourne. We ate lunch at the military base at Elsinbourne. Beautiful fall day. But we had been on the bus in the morning, and I knew we were going to be on the bus in the afternoon. So as we got to eating lunch, our bus and everybody else was over here. And as, as these guys would tell you, I would say, no, I'm going to go this way. So I'm going to walk a little bit. So I went walking down here, just looking around. I'm not, I get about a block away from where we were, maybe a long block. I'm not paying any attention. I'm just taking up the sunshine. And he means it. He don't pay attention very often. <laughs> and the military, Belgian military man, said, excuse me, sir, uh, what are you doing? I said, well, I've been on the bus all day with this tour group, and we're going to be back on just kind of walking around. We're just taking lunch. I'm kind of walking around, stretching a little bit. Now, he's very polite. He just said, I think maybe you ought to walk back that way. I said, okay. <laughs> so I turned around and walked where I came from. Now, why wasn't I supposed to be where I was? I don't know. <laughs> but I wasn't about to ask either. Because <laughs> I'm in a foreign country, on a military base, and yeah. maybe, I don't know. So I just turned around and walked back where I was, so forth. And by the way, he was talking about the canteen. My mother worked there at, at that canteen. And I used to run around behind the tables and under the tables when I was a little boy when they was doing that. I worked with a man who was in the 82nd Airborne when he was down to his last clip when Patton showed up. Yeah. And his son didn't even know what he'd done. I told him one day. They did. T they took us down also down to Bastogne. I about forgot to tell you about that, and and uh, that wasn't part of the north shoulder. That was the south shoulder. That the south shoulder was just protecting the flank of, of of the north shoulder from what they told us. But they showed us the machine gun machine gun bunker. That when Patton's first tank come up, that's where he and that's the first shot they fired when they got to Bastogne was into that bunker. And uh, they said he fired one shot, and they saw the Germans run out the back door and scoot out. That's the last they saw of them. They took us out also to where Easy Company was stationed, at, you know, when they was in Bastogne. And there's a nice little monument there that uh, Tom Hanks paid for and had erected there. It's really, really impressive. You're very, you're very accurate with your uh, man about the diggers. And they came to our us. Did they really? Super. Yeah. Was you in the 99th? Yeah. No kidding. Oh, man. Oh, Jiminy. That's something. I'm impressed. You guys went through a lot. Through a lot, bud. And these young people should know, so you guys should talk about it more. Because it's something that is going to be lost to history if, if we don't find out. And it's, they don't know what you young people went through. 19 years old, you said. Isn't that something? Yep. Makes you old fast, don't it? Bring tears to your eyes, I'll tell you. That's scary some of the stories you hear from these guys. I know my wife had an uncle that uh, went over, uh, he didn't get there until January uh, when the bulge was just about over, they had him back and he got wounded, but you, you couldn't, couldn't bring it out of him what, what happened to him. He said, I just got shot in the butt. He said, that, that, forget it. Oh God! Oh yeah. Oh, did they ever? Yeah, yeah. I don't know how they did it. I don't know how you could. I don't know if I could have done that or not. He wouldn't talk much about it. No, no. That's how we learned about it. Yeah, yeah. 
I'm sure some of you guys have stories to tell that uh, we should probably hear. That, uh, just too much. Well, thank you. Thank you.